Something About Cars, a podcast for car enthusiasts and the people who love them. Hello, this is The Thing About Cars. Welcome around the table. We've got Misty. How are you? And Ben? Feeling fantastic. Hey. And Don? I'm here. Excellent. And Dave, how are you, Dave? Rolling right along. And I'm Mickey Desai. We've got a, uh, a packed agenda today, so let's just jump into it. We have a grand trivia auto question. You guys ready? Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So Tim Rogers, who I'm tempted to ask to become our trivia czar. Can we have a <laughs> trivia czar? Is, is that okay? Can um, we get him a hat? Can we get him a I hat? Sp- sure. Yeah. If he's going to be the trivia czar, he needs a specific tiara type hat. <laughs> a tiara type hat? I mean, we could get, we could get him like the Pope's pistachio hat, but that's already in use. Oh, that's true. I was thinking like a pirate's uh, or like a colonial three point hat or something has... like that. Um, I was going more for like <laughs> that's a good idea. Dome as are, hat. Onion dome. Onion dome. Onion dome. All right. So Tim asks, uh, why did Nissan and Toyota rush to add rear doors to Pathfinders and Forerunners in the 1990s? Which I didn't realize that Nissan uh, Pathfinders and Forerunners didn't have rear doors. That was a that was a shock to me, a surprise to me. I think they may make it from a two door into a four door vehicle, right? So, um, in any case, why did they rush to add rear doors to the Pathfinders and Forerunners in the early 1990s? A, they wanted to differentiate their vehicles from the two door Suzuki Samurai. B, they wanted to better compete with the four door Jeep Cherokee XJ. C, they wanted to pay lower import tariffs. Or D, all of the above. Or E, none of the above. <laughs> Sinister. Okay. Yes. So one of those is the correct answer. We'll answer it at the end of the show. Loxley Brown is our guest for today. And let's segue right into our cultural collision for the day, which is uh, we've I've been playing with this idea for I've been playing with this idea for a while, and, and I'm afraid I failed in my own homework assignment here, where I asked the gang to come up with their own uh, five favorite um, car movies or movies about journeys or road trips. And I have struggled with a list that I can't narrow down to less than nine, nine names. So I'm still struggling with this list, but I wanted to toss it up there um, and have just a frank conversation about car movies in general, and, and maybe you know have that have something to do with our own top five car movies of the day. Um, I, I said I, it was five for all of us plus nine for you. This episode's going to last two days. <laughs> well, that's what I'm thinking. Should we just do one person's top five and then come back next, next month and do another top five or, or uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's the part where I fall down in my homework. It's like, okay, I've got this great idea and then no way to execute it. Right. So uh, <laughs> you know, I, I had a similar problem narrowing down. So the way I'm bar- Nope, I'll borrow some of you guys' because I <laughs> I was struggling to get past three. Well, I, let me let me tell you the, the criteria I use to see if uh, it's yeah. helpful. That uh, yeah, because that was the same thing. Like okay, there there are cars in virtually every movie, and you know that. Um, so my my rule was for to get to my top five, it had to be something that that involved a trip, a travel where the journey or the car played a key role. And there had to be at least the ve- the vehicle in question had to be an iconic car vis-a-vis the Thunderbird and Thelma and Louise. That, that, so a car itself in some way also had to be an important part of the film. It couldn't just be that they, you know, it, it, they just happened to be in a car. Since there's probably going to be some overlap between lists, I, I, I would suggest just taking turns throwing one out until we run out of stuff. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I think so, too. Well, that right, works so this, for me. What I'm going to do then is set a timer so that we don't actually spend two and a half days doing this. But, uh, <laughs> but I like Ben's idea. Everybody mention one, and let's just go around the room, and everyone can mention one, and then we'll come back later and do it again. All right, let's start the order on my screen here. Misty, do you have a, car, a movie that we should mention first, or...? Yeah, it, mine's not exactly about cars, although the the truck plays a big oh, part I'm in it. But it's more about a road trip. It's smoke signals. Um, it's about um, two young Native American guys 
and actually cars do play a part in this because there's a car that only goes in reverse. They're on a reservation in Coeur d'Alene, uh, Idaho, and one of their dads, his dad passes away and he's out in like Arizona or, you know, further out west. And they have to take a trip to go collect his dad's ashes and then they drive his truck back. And it's, it, it's really a great movie. Cool. It's probably one of my favorite What kind of truck of is times. it? It's a very old, beat up one, and I'm trying to remember. It's it's been a while since I've seen it, even though it is one of my favorites. And I want to say okay. it might be a Ford, and it's probably held together with um, so once again, why wishes, does this failing again? wire and spit. This, because um, it's the whole journey. When you start out with the movie, you have some guy that's parked right. on top of an RV giving the reservation traffic report which is hysterical. And then you have the oh, two yeah. girls in the I car really that only exactly goes in reverse. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and then the bus journey to get to his dad's old place and then the drive back, you know, and it, it, it's really a coming of age and a growing up yeah. and coming to terms with your uh, past that was not as good as you may have wanted it, but it, I've described well, parts of my time. career that you way. Always as awful as it seemed. <laughs> all of my career, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good stuff, Misty. Okay, cool. And that, I mean, re you reminded me as I was trying to struggle to 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 take down my list. It's like, you know, I'm I'm only going to choose from movies that I've seen, and there are tons of movies out there around cars and journeys that I have yet to see that I have a lot of catch up work to do. You know, m movies that I've heard good things about, but. Uh, just uh, just haven't yet seen them. But anyway, Ben, what's yours? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to start with the Gumball Rally. Oh yeah, Gumball. Yeah, this was this came out in 1976, and it was the, as far as I know, the first attempt to make a you know fictional comedy type movie about a, a real life event, the Cannonball Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash which is a, a real breathful there. Uh, you know, this was a, an event that uh, Brock Yates had something to do with the organizing of where these, you know, people just did a completely illegal coast to coast race uh, with very little, you know, rules regarding what they ran in or where, what route they took or anything like that. I did not mention the cannonball run in this place because I know somebody, I'll let somebody else bring that one up later because I know it's on probably most of our lists. <laughs> but uh, but the Gumball Rally was the predecessor. It wasn't as commercially successful as uh, Cannonball Run was. It didn't have as much star power. It certainly didn't have as much promotion behind it, uh, and it wasn't aimed at you know adolescent kids. Uh, but I think Raul Julia was in it. That's the only famous person I can remember off the top of my head. He plays, uh, I believe, an Italian professional race car driver. Franco. Uh, yeah. There's... yeah that, th this is a crossover one because this is also on my list. It's one of the first ones I remember, and Franco gave the most memorable line in that movie. Yeah. The first rule of Italian driving is what is behind me is not important. Right, as he rips the <laughs> rearview mirror off and throws it aside. <laughs> as, as someone who has ridden as a, pa as a passenger frequently in Italy, I can is. guarantee that that is I thought is it was a pretty good movie. You know, there's there's a, another scene in there somewhere where uh, some cops pull over some of the contestants out in the desert somewhere and they avoid a ticket by telling them that they're out there making a movie. And if you look real hard and squint at that, you know, maze away over there, you could see the camera up there. The guys go speeding off while the cops are still squinting at it, trying to see where the camera is. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> just, you know, great shenanigans like that. Uh, right. I do recommend it. Excellent. Don, you said you had at least three. I, d I do have at least three. I mean, I actually have five because when I applied, um, something similar to what Dave, I had a criteria and it really was more revealing about me than yeah, the fair. cars. Uh, my top five are, are really, the theme seems to be the car is um, hurt, maimed or otherwise totaled in the making of the film. And I, it made me realize how much I love cars and, and maybe I need some <laughs> help. Um, because I was more worried about the cars than I was about I'm, the people I'm about in the cars. <laughs> yeah. So my very top one, of course, is Risky Business because the Porsche 1979 928 um, takes a dip in Lake Michigan 
And there's just no. I love that bit where the uh, the the, the <laughs> service guy at the dealer walks in and says, "All right, who's the U-boat captain?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and that you know j- just got me thinking about. Um, so I did some research about this particular car in this movie and found that it was just the director's whim to say this is the car we're using, and he did it because he knew. The suburbs of Chicago, and at the time, this particular—I mean, it, it was probably the cheapest and the most easiest accessible uh, Porsche at the time. You know, the 928 was not that that souped up, and you know, you could drive it to work, and there was plenty to, room to put stuff in the trunk, and uh, you know, it was kind of like the, your dad, upper middle class dad's kind of midlife thing. So I just. I just think risky business is that's my top. I wonder whatever happened to that actual car. Um, actually, I did look and it was owned um, by a guy who wanted to make a film about the car. And his, this individual was, uh, he had owned the car and he was really about, he was trying to make some documentary about the car of risky business. And he spent his life savings on it and then ended up having to sell the car for $40,000 to recoup his life savings back. And it ended up in the possession of, it looks like a veteran who collected cars and was just, um, collected cars to, let me look at his name. Yeah, military memorabilia dealer, Patrick Shea, purchased it at the aforementioned auction for him his and his father's collection of iconic movie cars, which includes the 1981 DeLorean of Back to the Future 3 and the 85 Toyota SR5 4x4 in Back to the Future 2 wow. and 3. He also has several cars owned by Steve McQueen. Uh, the other thing that was fascinating about the, um, or surprising about the inclusion of the 928 is it's, a, it's now become collectible and people are collecting it. So it's like an oh, it was a long forsaken brand that people just didn't look at. Um, but you won't you won't be paying forty thousand dollars <laughs> now. Uh, the the, uh, the other interesting thing is uh, so the car seventy it's a seventy nine. They used seventy eights and eighties and eighty ones. Then depending on what they were trying to do, they used a, a five speed transmission and an automatic. Depending on again what they were shooting. The one that went into Lake Michigan was a uh, shell. It okay. didn't have a tranny or a engine in it. Okay. So I was wondering if they actually um, threw the actual yeah, car into the lake. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. Uh, matter of fact, that's the other theme in on all of mine is the actual car that was in good shape. It didn't ever get <laughs> to its final demise. They, there were there were <laughs> <Yeah>. stunt cars. <laughs> all right, Dave. So I. Um, uh, not only did I come up with, with five movies, one of which was Gumball Rally, I've also I've arranged mine in the order in which I saw them. And so the very first movie that I remember actually being aware of road tripping in cars was 1963's uh, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Mm, yeah. And, you know, that, you know, I remember seeing that on television. I was probably six or seven, and I was just mesmerized by it (laughs) and you know not only did did everybody who was anybody in hollywood appear in this film but almost you know the 60s it really underscores that the 60s was you know the the pinnacle of convertible production in this country um that that there were just so many great classic Mm -hmm. convertible cars in that movie Uh, and um, it, we've said this before, you know, I'm, I, I only own convertibles because I like driving outside so much. So this, even though every, there were so many cars in it, I'll t- allude to those in a second, probably the star car in this is driven by <laughs> Jay and Russell Finch, um, played by Milton Berle, and he drives a light blue 1962 Chrysler Imperial Crown Convertible with a pearl white leather interior. Uh. And one of the things... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, yeah. This is why we don't actually show the camera shots of us on the show. <laughs> ben just leaned back, got this lustful look, and lit a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the one of the things that's wild about this car too is there are only five hundred and fifty four of those cars built. So they are super rare right now. Um, like Don, I tried to chase down that car and it looks like the last time it sold, it sold for $150,000. Wow, so, wow. Um, also appearing in this movie, uh, I so this, this is how I spent coffee um, this morning. Also appearing in this movie were a 1957 Ford Fairlane, yes. a 1962 Dart 440 convertible, an early VW Cabriolet, a 48 Ford Super Deluxe convertible, a 1956 Sunliner, and a Belvedere wagon. <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing movie. I remember seeing that as a kid, also being completely transfixed yeah. by it. And of course, back in those days, all the film references and all the, the star cameos, most of them were completely just way over my head. But uh, it was just, you know, that kind of wackiness really appealed to me when I was that age. But. Cool. Um, my movie that I picked uh, amongst the nine that I can't narrow down on, um, the, the one I'll mention today is Herbie the Love Bug. Uh, you stole mine. And, and, oh, <laughs> huh, you stole one of mine. <laughs> and I, I, it's just one of those things, right? I mean, you know, you know watching Herbie as an adult kind of it loses its charm as an adult. It's definitely a, a for kids kind of thing. But uh, but there was something about watching those movies as a child that just has yeah. a, a, a permanent place in my in my my psychology now. So uh, Herbie, yes, absolutely, the love bug. Love that movie. That's it's yeah. That that probably started my love affair with Super Volkswagens, cute. which then transferred to Gias and uh -huh. you know yeah. So is yep. that Kurt Russell? Was he Kurt the Russell. guy? Yeah. What was Kurt he Russell. in Herbie? Yep, Herbie the Interesting. He's been in a lot yeah. of stuff and like like a lot. He's got a long and, and, and varied history in movie making that goes all the way back deep into Disney realm. And all, I, it's just easy to forget that. That may be one of his first movies. Mm -hmm. Yep, Herbie stuff. Good stuff. All right. So I guess the question is do we do we just take a movie and mention it? as part of an ongoing segment with the, the podcast or uh, now that I've, we've come this far, um, do we just wrap up <laughs> our top five with uh, each person gets a top five for each week or something like that. I, I will have to, we'll talk about that offline, um, but good stuff. I, let's move on to our next segment, which is um, Ben takes a moment, Ben, take it away. Yeah. Well, kind of, uh, you know, rolling on the coattails of that. Uh, I would like to take a moment to talk about cars and movies and I don't mean thematically, but I mean the actual cars <laughs> and the day-to-day -day business of making movies with cars in them. Um, it's it's a wild thing because a lot of people think of the car from, from X movie or TV show or something. And as Don said, there are usually stunt cars. And there's usually more than one just for, you know, having a backup purposes. Um, interesting example of that is uh, The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, which, of course, I would have to mention being both a James Bond freak and a Lotus freak. Uh, yes. the, the factory sent two Esprits mm -hmm. to the production basically for redundancy purposes, you know, but they both wound up being used for different things because, as it turned out, the camera vehicle couldn't keep up with it. So one of the cars was pressed into service as a camera vehicle. Uh, I, I've seen one picture oh. of this. Uh, it's a still shot that is used in the closing credits of the making of featurette on the DVD that shows this white Esprit with a camera mounted on top, battery packs strapped to the nose. Uh, <laughs> the, I believe the engine lid is removed, the hatch on the rear, and the camera operator is sitting in there, and it's following the other car. Uh, they also wound up using uh, Roger Becker, the representative that the factory sent with the cars, to the location to do most of the driving because the stunt driver just wasn't uh, very adept with mid-engine cars and couldn't get the performance out of it that they needed. So he's the one doing the driving in most of the scenes you see. Uh, and you can find a great interview with him about that on YouTube where he talks about how, you know, what an interesting experience it was. Uh, years ago, I had a, uh, you know, money on the side job doing uh, security on 
uh, TV shoot locations. And one of the places they sent me was the production office where the series Prison Break was based. This was in Dallas, Texas when I lived out there. And uh, one of the first things I remember checking out when I first toured the office was the, uh, the transpo department where they kept all the cars and they, you know, I met the transportation captain or transpo captain as they call him. He's the guy who's in charge of all the wheels. Uh, not only the stuff on screen, but also the, just the logistics of all the production vehicles, all those camera trucks and things. And, uh, I got to sit on a motorcycle used in the, the series and, you know, there was a Toyota Yaris they used in it that was parked in there and a black Mercedes and, uh, it's kind of cool stuff. Uh, as far as stunt vehicles go, the, I'm thinking of two things, a TV show and a movie, and I'm not sure which holds the record for the most vehicles destroyed making the production. <laughs> One of them is the Dukes of Hazard. They destroyed a whole lot of Dodge Chargers. In fact, the, yes, the, they, did. <laughs> they single-handedly did more to boost the value uh, of Chargers of, of that era in the present day than anything else. They created a, a scarcity that is just unreal. It was yeah. so much so, in fact, that in the later seasons, they weren't even using chargers because they were having trouble finding them at that point. They actually used some four-door AMC products for a couple of the more blurry, you know, fast-moving scenes where you weren't likely to spot the difference. Uh, the other one is uh, the Blues Brothers because that's... <laughs> oh, yeah, hugely... Yes, horrific destruction of cars, the yeah. big police chase scene toward the end, they destroyed a whole lot of I, <laughs> cars. In that must have been a fleet of police cars, like a hundred. Yeah, I forget what they used. I think they might have been Dodge Monaco's because that's what everybody used for police cars in the 70s. Uh, that's yeah. what they used on chips, I remember, too. Uh, but yeah, they destroyed a whole lot of cars in, in that. So yeah, fun stuff. And of course, you know, they they probably destroy well they destroyed cars making all kinds of movies they they, they destroyed a lot of them in uh, you know the road warrior uh, but yeah it's it's interesting stuff to to really think about how they how they make this stuff you know the nice ones they use for the close ups and the not so nice ones they use for the the stunt work or the more distant shots the B unit stuff things like that. Now you know why I feel so bad about the cars. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> well, and the the Ferrari replica used in the first two seasons of Miami Vice was in fact destroyed. Yeah. The 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 scene where it gets blown up that was not a stunt vehicle. They really did destroy the actual car, and that was uh, that came out of a dispute with Ferrari because the car was a replica. It never was a real Daytona Spider. It was right. it was oh. it was a uh, Corvette based replica created by a guy named McBurney. Uh, I forget his first name, but you could buy a, a McBurney, you know, Daytona Spider kit to put on a Corvette chassis, and that's what this was. I knew it was a replica pretty much as soon as I saw it because it had the same door handles as my dad's Alpha Spider, uh, <laughs> and the interior didn't quite look right, but. Uh, yeah, Ferrari was really upset that this big major hit TV show was, uh, you know, using a replica to portray one of their cars. So they wound up reaching an agreement. The production blew up the car, worked that into the storyline, um, and then they replaced it with an actual Ferrari, the white Testarossa that we all recall. And I have seen that car in the flesh. It's on display at uh, a uh, oh I forget the name of the place I think it's called the Florida Swap Meet or Smart Swap Mart or something it's it's a flea market mall in Fort Lauderdale Florida the the guy who <laughs> owns a... yeah the guy who owns it's it's a otherwise kind of trashy establishment it's just you know low end you know cheap imported goods and stuff like that but the guy who owns it has this car collection that's in there along with a Porsche 959 uh, and several other just really cool things mm -hmm. but. Here's the Miami Vice Testarossa sitting on a turntable. It's rotating. It's, you know, got, you know, like fluorescent colored lettering in the windows, you know, identifying it like the kind you see on used car lots, identifying it as the TV show car. And, you know what we should do? We should go rescue it. Yeah, we should. We'll <laughs> yeah, it needs to be liberated. That's for sure. I, I, I fully agree. Um, since I'm not in the country, I will yeah. coordinate bail bondsmen for you guys. Well, we'll need it because the guy is uh, pretty protective of it. He's been offered serious money for it, and he he will not sell. So, huh. 
Yeah, he'll die someday. Yeah. So right. <laughs> Hopefully not soon. And if he does, no, uh, no, no wishing uh, anything think, bad. Yes, no, nothing no. about cars would like to go on record right now of saying <laughs> we are not endorsing murder, <laughs> death, or grand theft auto. <laughs> and, and we don't wish anybody's early demise. No. We just know that someday it will change hands. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because right now we're we're very quickly approaching the territory of um, premeditation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just, but it's, it's interesting though about how can um, we premeditate something about a guy we don't even know his name <laughs> he owns a car we want yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. we don't care what his name is we just know that there's a car you know that's being that's being put on put on display against its will yeah, yeah. It's a hostage situation it's hostage <laughs> I think it's uh, I can I think it, it leans over to even more nefarious. <laughs> Dave's going to save the day here. Well, I'm going to bring us back from the, from the realm of the illegal because I I really feel like I have learned genuine insight of about my friends and colleagues on this panel, <laughs> and, and you know even though Mickey you are the the trained therapist I'm I'm just sitting here doing a little psychoanalysis when I bring together the data points that you know. Don is deeply disturbed by the destruction of cars versus Ben's take his moment. I'm wondering if in Don's world, the Blues Brothers is an ep epic Greek tragedy. <laughs> mm. You know, for Don, Don I just, I'm just, I'm picturing you sitting at the end of Blues Brothers, totally devastated, like you just sat through Hamlet. Exactly. I'm crying. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, talking about all the cars that destroyed, this was actually an American thing, and not just cars, but with motor, with transportation, oh, yeah, yeah. way before motion pictures. <laughs> um, yeah. They used to literally organize steam engine crashes. Yes, train, railroad crashes. Yeah. You know, yeah. and because um, I, I was, I, I was listening to, uh, to, to another podcast about, uh, weird crap that happens in the south which is like daily and it was talking about um the crash at crush oh yeah two big giant steam engines colliding two big giant boilers under lots of pressure exploding that's pretty spectacular yeah yeah, yeah. so that's uh, apparently that's uh, something very deep in the psyche of americans we like to see transportation things go boom i'll tell you what Maybe though. this explains the the the, the rubbernecking phenomenon right while we're I mean, down maybe. in south florida you know chickening out from stealing the uh, the miami vice <laughs> testarossa we can, we can then go you know right down the road to miami and uh, go check out the desert collection museum uh he's got a bunch of tv and movie cars in there some real some replica some you're not quite sure uh, they're not really placarded very accurately but then he has among the collection this one room that is a spectacular James Bond collection. Uh, not just cars, he's got all kinds of things in there. There's the f fuselage mock-up from, uh, oh, which movie was it? The jet Goldfinger. Airplane. I believe so, yes. Uh, the Odd Job <laughs> Rolls-Royce is in there. Uh, Helen Mirren. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the, the Esprit from For Your Eyes Only is in there. The, wow. the motorcycle from the world is not enough, uh, yeah, or w one of those, I, those Pierce Brosnan movies all kind of run together for me, despite being very enjoyable. Uh, yeah, the Q-boat from one of the Brosnan movies is in there. Uh, a gadget at Aston Martin is in there, and that's another one that's been much disputed because a lot of people tour around a DB5 with you know guns and wheel spikes and things like that, claiming that it's the car. Uh, as far as I know, four were built, and as far as which, which one did the most on-screen time, nobody seems to know today which one is one of the ones. Uh, and uh, after, you know, sometime after Goldfinger, I think several more probably got you know turned into these kind of cars. So, so I have one question before we wrap your segment, Ben, which is you know in in the Spy Who Loved Me, they drove in a spree into the sea and then out of the sea. Right. Salt water plus a spree doesn't equal damaged car. Oh, sure it does, and you know there's a little bit of movie magic there because first of all, the one driving into the sea isn't even real at all. Uh, it was a, uh, I believe, quarter scale. Well, no, the the one going off the pier and into the water is a full size body shell 
that's being you know driven off the pier by a, a pneumatic ram, if I recall correctly. And this is why you see a bunch of white debris kind of flying around as it goes off the end of the pier because some of the fiberglass on the underside of the car was damaged in the process. Uh, then when you see it sink through the water, that one's a quarter scale model. It's easily identifiable by its smooth white underbelly. Yes. Uh, and then the one driving yeah. out of the sea at the end is, I believe it's a real car. I don't know if it had a powertrain in it, but it's being pulled by a cable, which if you look very, very closely in a couple spots, you'll see the cable kind of nudging its way out of the sand a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and the the bit with uh, the, the guy with the bottle, that was an improv. The, the guy was one of the film crew. I forget his name. But uh, it went over so so well that they used that again in the next two movies, <laughs> various scenes with the same guy. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, and it it turned the world on its ear when they saw that. Uh, as far as the underwater scenes, though, that was all done with body shells that had been modified into submarines. The the factory supplied a total of five body shells in addition to the two running cars to the production, and they were used for various different things, either to make the complete submarine or for various close-up scenes, you know, with the fins unfolding and things like that. Right. Okay. You know, I, I think it's interesting that um, some, what I was reading as I was researching my movies, some movies, you know, it's all about placement and they're now getting lots of, there's lots of ad oh, yeah. time. And they had a good relationship in the Bond movies, but with the risky business, Porsche wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah, them. I'm not surprised. And and they didn't supply any cars. They had to source them from local dealers. Yeah. So, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I can't think of any car company that would want to be associated with that particular storyline. Yeah. Oh, but, and that was their primary yeah. reason. Yeah, they were like, no, we, we are not going to endorse this particular <laughs> risky business. Right. Uh, I mean, company, companies... Are, are protective of that, like with brands. It's the reason you'll never see a, a movie about an airplane crash using a real airline's um, livery logo. or logo. Yeah. 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 That would definitely be um, bad for marketing. It is bad for marketing. <laughs> yeah. That, when I was in, in marketing at Delta, periodically someone would say, hey, we want to put your brand on something. And not only hell no, but hell no, and here's a restraining order. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, I think probably the only people worse than than airlines is House of Mouse. What's that? People were only the only people worse than airlines is who? House of Mouse. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 They yeah. are just absolutely. I mean, they are brutal. They are. Yeah, they're very protective. Well, thank you, Ben. Good stuff. Thanks for taking a moment. You betcha. Misty, do you have news today, or should we do a a, a listener question? Well, actually, I don't. You know. I mean, the only news I have is that Max won and Hamilton didn't, which for me is the only news you guys need to know. Um, <laughs> but I was actually going to tackle Dave's question because oh. I was just like, okay, whatever. Yeah, go for it. And I mean, I've been like eyebrow deep in Google. And I've come to like one of two conclusions. What for the listeners? You want me to get the question out there? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and re I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, this is cool. um, okay. Uh, um, the horn on the Jeep no longer works in the evenings. So, um, uh, possibly related to temperature. It works in the morning. It works in, in midday. Even after sitting in the sun, it does not work after sitting an entire day in the sun. So I had two questions for this. A, what year and model of Jeep is this? It is a 2008 Wrangler X. Okay. So that doesn't actually narrow it down anymore. So the first option that I had is your car is haunted and you just need to have it exercised. <laughs> it's, entirely possible. it's entirely possible. No. Um, the second one, um, and trust me, I looked and I mean, I was like, you know, and I'm excellent with Google Foo and I could not find any other person on the internet having this problem with the Jeep. The closest I came was... Uh, and I actually ended up on Stack Exchange for this, <laughs> of all places. I was like, okay. It was a 2006 Nissan Note, and the guy basically says the same thing. Um, with one exception, he says, I need to apply force to the horn in order for it to work. And during the midday sun, it doesn't work at all. 
Um, so there was, you know, lots of questions. You know, is the relay working? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, he said, no, there's no click. And said, it could be that um, the plastic trim around the horn is expanding in the heat and causing an issue. Um, and mm. their uh, fix would be to remove the plastic trim covering the horn push and applying white silicone spray grease to the rear face of the plastic and the parts it clips into. Um, but that's one issue. And but the other issue I thought might also, because I, I saw a lot of people saying, you know, look, um, your horn isn't really weatherproofed. So um, it could be um, like moisture, like it, you know, because exactly. I mean, Georgia's humid. We all yeah, know. is it, this is a, this is your Wrangler that the top comes off or yeah. you have to take all the, so. Yeah, yeah, but this is, this, it started last summer. Um, and I, it was a, it was a chronic problem, but we, you know, because of the pandemic, I wasn't driving that much. And then, um, it got wrecked in November by, by the construction vehicle. And so I, when it was being rebuilt, I wasn't even sure if I was going to keep it or not. And then they did such a good job of rebuilding it. As we've talked about, you know, I'm, I am verklempt over when and how to make the switch to an electric vehicle. Um, plus the fact the Wrangler really is, you know, the car I should have bought when I was 24 years old. <laughs> um, it's just that much of a joy to drive. Um, but, you know, driving to um, school uh, last Monday, driving in Atlanta without a horn is in rush hour is really not a practical exercise. <laughs> I agree. I well, agree. One of my questions was going to be, have you driven the Jeep into Lake Michigan at all? Um, I have not. Okay. You know, or, or it could be that um, when it expands, like, and there's movement, that some of the connections are wiggling loose. You know, it, like I said, I have never come up on, on an issue where there was such, like, no information. Like, nobody's had this problem. You're apparently the only person out of 7 billion people that has had this problem. This well, would not be the only problem that the other seven billion have not had. Right. <laughs> so you know, um, you know. So basically, we've narrowed it down to um, you need to call a priest, uh, or there's um, something with uh, the trim around the horn push that is uh, giving you problems. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. I interfering with the um, connection, or there's moisture in there somewhere. Hmm. Okay. I go look. I can... the, interesting, the interesting thing about the trim piece is to get to that, I have to take the airbag cover off because yeah. on the Wrangler, you push on the airbag. Now, I guess I could really solve this by just deploying the airbag, but that <laughs> kind of defeats you know the other purpose of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Are you going to take a blow dryer for you know the moisture problem? Yeah. <laughs> Because I, so, I, I guess the, the the one last question, you know, is like when you push the horn, does the relay go click? Mm -mm, I don't hear the relay click. So I'm wondering if maybe it's a bad relay. I hadn't thought of that until you said that. It, it, yeah, it mm -hmm. could also be a fuse or something like but that. But how many times do you actually hear a relay go click when you hit the horn? Well, you don't because you hear the horn. But you would think you know, that if the horn w isn't going, you should hear a relay click. And I don't hear anything. Well, that's assuming that the I relay mean, is located someplace where you would hear it. Yeah. Right. Right. And and here's the, the really question: Have you tried to use the horn in the morning? Yes. Oh yes. Okay. I, you know, you know, the, the evening is not the only time Atlanta drivers piss me off. <laughs> okay. Well, you got a point. Yeah. And 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 the idea of getting a priest over here, you know, oddly, you know, having spent twelve years in Catholic school, that's an oddly disturbing concept. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't All necessarily the, suggesting Catholic. I mean, Episcopalians. Oh, that's true. Know, I could do that. You know, I mean, you know, Lutherans. Lutherans yeah. are really good at that. Um, um, I, 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 and yeah, Wicca. yeah, good, good Wicca. I will go on the Voodoo. record as saying that that you know, it, I'm not in any way disparaging Catholic priests. You know, having grown up in Catholic school, no priest ever made advances at me. And candidly, I think I'm a little insulted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and you have a problem with my nun problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, merciful. 
Oh, and y'all. we're back. Bless y'all. Y'all, y'all have just made my Sunday. I, I was going to say, I'm... there's there are no Episcopalian nuns. That's that's the. Is there, there are, are there Episcopalian nuns? There are there are Episcopalian sisters. Wow, excellent. All right, so uh, so here's why I don't think it's a moisture problem, at least not one related to humidity. If it were, your hun your horn would not work in the morning. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That that was the one caveat that I had. I was kind of like, you know, why is it working in the morning if it's a moisture problem? But right. that was literally the most common reason that I saw. Yeah. So I had, I you know, I kind of had to throw that in there. It was, you know, well, Dave parks his car like, outdoors, if I'm not mistaken, and I do. and that means, you know, morning dew, morning mist, all that stuff is is definitely a feature or a factor for keeping your car outdoors. So if it were a moisture problem, uh, I th you would think it would be worse in the morning. But uh, uh, but because it's a temperature problem, it's got to be either a loose connection or something. I don't know, a relay. It could be the relay that just doesn't like the heat. So light bulb moment. Yeah. Do you park your car under a tree? No, actually, it, it uh, it, it's probably the sun, most sunblasted part of our property. It's from in the front of the house. Oh, I was going up with you know somehow tree sap found its way into your horn mechanism, and uh, you know, and, and it a, worked okay in the morning because it was solid, and but then as it melted, you know, okay. and it caused a problem. Right. But, oh well. I appreciate yeah, that. Yep. Like I said, I was grasping at straws for this because I was, you know, eyebrow deep in Google and everybody was like, nope, never had that problem before in my life. <laughs> Not the first time I've heard that with one of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> Let's answer our Grand Trivia Auto question, shall we? Sure. Grand Trivia Auto question from our Trivia Czar, Tim Rogers. Why did <laughs> Nissan and Toyota rush to add rear doors to Pathfinders and Forerunners in the early 1990s? And so I guess, again, this is uh, turning a two-door vehicle into a four-door vehicle. Uh, did they do this because they wanted to differentiate their vehicles from the two-door Suzuki Samurai? Did they do it because they wanted to better compete with the four-door Jeep Cherokee? Or that they wanted to pay imp lower import tariffs? That's answer C. So A, differentiate from the two-door Suzuki Samurai. B, compete with the four-door Jeep, C, pay lower import tariffs, D, all of the above, E, none of the above. Uh, let's start with Dave. What do you think? You know what? B and C both saw sound plausible to me. I can't believe that, that they necessarily saw the Suzuki as that much competition, but as I'm thinking about it, there was some resemblance. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with all of the above. Okay. Don, what do you think? Yeah, I was thinking that SUV, that's when the SUVs really started getting popular among suburban families, and it's a marketing thing. So, yeah, I, I think kind of, except for the tariff thing makes me kind of question the all of the above. I'd go with A and B, but that's not an option, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the opposite of Dave and say none of the above. <laughs> ben, what do you think? Oh, I am so torn on this. Uh, <laughs> it's a weird one. Uh, but uh, hey. <laughs> that's a great sound. Yeah. <laughs> that is the opposite of Ben's lust. It is. Sound. It's like, oh, get away. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh versus hey. That's the imitation of my dad's old Plymouth not wanting to start in the morning. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I I feel weird enough about it. I, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go with none of the above. Just why not? Why not none of the above? Okay, Misty. What do you think? Uh, I'm gonna be on Team Dave. It, you know, those, those are really logical answers. Yes. Um, I mean, I don't know that I'd want to be mistaken for a Suzuki Samurai. <laughs> so um, well, it's kind of hard. You know, it's kind of hard to 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 be mistaken for the Samurai. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. That's, um, yeah. The answer is actually all of the above. Oh, wow. So, the, well, according to Tim, and this is in an article that he sourced, and he actually gave us the, 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 uh, the, oh, God, why, the reference. Thank you. Why can't I think of the word reference? <laughs> he actually gave us the reference. Um, the U.S. government had just classified the Samurai as a light truck because it only had two doors. Light trucks paid a 25% tariff, while four-door SUVs were passenger vehicles that only paid a 2.5% tariff. Huh. Nissan sued the U.S. government and got the two doors equal light truck rule thrown out in 1994. So 
So all of the above, they wanted to differentiate themselves from the, from the two-door Suzuki light truck. Uh, they wanted to compete in the SUV market and they, a 10 times tariff between a passenger vehicle and a light truck. That's kind of a, kind of a shock to me. I did not know that about the time. So thank you, Tim. Say what? Differentiating from the light truck category is one thing, but from the Samurai as an individual product, uh, uh, sounds kind of bogus to me because it was it was so, sold at such a lower price point and was so much smaller. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tim, as our as our trivia czar, I really appreciate it. We have to think about getting him a, a special hat or or something. Something, uh, yeah. To do that. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Loxley Brown is in the room. Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> hey. hey there. How's everybody doing? Good. How are you doing? Great to see you, Loxley. Good. Yeah, Loxley. How are things going? Celebrating. <laughs> What's yeah. the celebration? Well, it's 10 o'clock in the morning here, so it's still brunch time. Yeah. Um, yesterday was the second anniversary of the day this idea sparked in my head. So we are definitely celebrating that because we have managed to get a lot done in two years yeah. that most would not be able to do. So a little force of nature right here. <laughs> Turbocharger, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, what What's on deck for you guys for the remainder of this year into the summer? Um, so we have summer camps coming up at the end of June. We're going to have five this year instead of just one. So for me, that means making a whole lot of connections because we bring in industry experts to talk to the girls and give them, you know, the real kind of the Wizard of Oz, you pull that curtain back, you really get to see what the jobs are like, but it also gives them a better idea of all of the different job opportunities because most little girls in middle school and high school don't even think about what's out there. So um, our first camp is going to be the land, sea, and air, and we've got engineers from McLaren's F1 calling in on the first day. The second day, we're talking to the engineer and the designer that designed the new Cadillac Lyric EV. Um, on Wednesday, we're talking with a super yacht crew and one of the captains of the blue and gold fleet up in San Francisco. So like every day is just something new like that. And then we also have a fab camp. We have a public speaking camp. Um, our fab camp last year, I shouldn't blow over that one so quickly. It was humongous. That was what really got the girls excited. And we built a drifting trike and showed the entire fabrication process from concept all the way through to something that rolls and works. <laughs> so, and that was from a whole pile of scraps and parts and COVID had just started. So getting parts was nearly impossible. Um, and we managed to build that and get it done in six weeks, which was kind of huge for us. So oh, wow. that That's was a really fun camp. This That's year- so cool. Yeah, we're building, um, a, we can't completely announce it yet, but a robot. So this robot's gonna do something fun and special. Um, and we're also going to build a cart that attaches to the biggest greyhound that you will ever meet um, because his owner works with disabled children. And I thought it would be fun and cute to have a cart that he could pull like a little pony with the kids in it. So nice. those are the kind of things that we do that are fun. Yeah. That's really cool. Excellent. So when you and I last spoke offline, you mentioned that you were trying to reach oh. out into the Southeast a little more. Yes. We want our girls to come to us from everywhere. Um, right now we're primarily based in Southern California. That's where the majority of our students come from, just because I have a really great <laughs> relationship with the San Diego <laughs> Board of Education. But this is the summer we have 830 seats for girls to join us for these camps. Each one of the camps and workshops is 100 seats. So I want all of those filled. And I would love to have some Southern girls join us because I'm a Southern girl. We need some, <laughs> we need some representation from the South. <laughs> So how do we do that? How do we help you with outreach? And how do we, I mean, I guess the first question I have is if, if I'm a parent with a girl who wants to be in your camp, um, I have to be responsible for getting her to you or does the camp happen here? What, what does that mean? Well, you could, send your you could send your daughter UPS. <laughs> exactly. UPS works. We don't actually have to worry about that because everything's virtual. So you just have to have a computer and they're pretty good now. 
at Sweet. zooming. I mean, they can probably zoom better than we can. So they, they've taught me a few tricks and we have our keyword. We say speed bump when something's happening. And in the background, I'm like this trying to get everything <laughs> put back together. And I have one that's always designed to like, just keep chatting. So she keeps everybody entertained while I fix everything. So uh, that's our terminology for or, or, um, explanation for speed bump. So Loxley, what's the age range you're looking for? Uh, middle school and high school. So from 12 years old to 18 years old, the parents do have to be involved. So they do have to give permission regardless of the age because there's that 13 year range where, you know, mm -hmm. 13 on they can sign up themselves. But I require that a parent be involved with this because this is like business. This is not, you know, yeah. like being a Daisy Scout. We're <clears throat> teaching them about business. We're teaching them how to be a true career professional. We're giving them essential life skills that'll really help them become bigger and better at what they do. And these are, I mean, I've got a sixth grader who is out there going after sponsorships and, you know, she's helping to write articles for the website and she's like the biggest go getter you'll ever meet. She's super cute on videos and she already has her plan of how she's going to go grow through Athena Racing and become the president by the time she's a senior in high school. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. So. <laughs> have you, have you thought about connecting with girls on the run? Uh, they're a, a nonprofit national organization that has young girls. And I bet you, you know, they kind of stop around middle school. It could be an opportunity to give them a pipeline for the rest. And Girls on the Run is pretty big in the South. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know about that organization. Yeah. The one that I kind of, I wish I could meet the founder of is Girls Who Code because she yeah. started that organization eight years ago and it has grown to what it is in eight years. And I just think she was phenomenal with what she's done, you mm -hmm. know, the platform that she's now given her girls that she works with. So, you know, I'm, she's one of those like to sit down and have a, a long conversation with of how did you do it and how did you build it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so if you want to, yeah, you could get us some info and we uh, could push it out to our networks and post okay. it on our, yeah, for sure. you know, yeah. Facebook and LinkedIn. And um, I think this is great. I'm looking at your website and I'm just like, wow, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Loxley, if, uh, if a listener wanted to get in touch with you or to point any of their friends to you for their children's sake, how would you suggest they find you? Um, go to the website, athenaracing.org. They can go ahead and start registering for the camps. If you go to the events tab, you'll see all of the summer camps listed there. So if they want to attend camp, they need to hurry up and get registered. That's the place to do it. It is free. It is virtual. So they can do it from anywhere in the world. We're actually setting up education hubs in Costa Rica and in Nepal and possibly in South Africa so that the girls there because the time zones are a little bit different and because you know it's underrepresented countries so these girls are not the ones who have a computer and wi-fi um so we're setting up a central place where we can get 10 or 20 to gather and they'll be watching our camps the day after yeah. because we're recording all the camps so that'll give them the opportunity to learn also yeah, which is a huge awesome. thing so. the fact that you're doing it free and virtually is huge and i hope that people take advantage yeah. of that opportunity yes. for their yeah. girl's sake so thank you as always Loxley for joining us does anyone else have any questions for Loxley before we wrap oh also they can join as a member for free too right now oh. we are offering free memberships during COVID so they should definitely sign up as a member cool okay. so people just need to go to athenaracing.org right yes just go to athenaracing.org everything is there the I love this. places this to register great. camps and the place to join yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, Loxley. As always, uh, always good to have you at the table with us here on The Thing About Cars. Thank you. It was great being here, guys. And to our audience, thanks as always for joining us here at The Thing About Cars. We love it when you send in your questions and your trivia items. Uh, it, as always, we hope you're out there being safe, getting vaccinated, wearing a mask, all those good things. We'll see you with another episode in about a week. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Yeah. for listening. This has been The Thing About Cops. We'll see you on the road.